As we come to look at this passage, let's pray. Father of God of grace and truth, help me to speak your word truthfully this morning and open our hearts to hear your truth by the power of your spirit from your word. Amen. Well, back in March, I went to a licensing service for a friend of mine um, at a church in Sissinghurst, which is the other end of Kent. Um, it was a dark evening, um, particularly wet evening as well, and I had to drive through lots of country lanes. And to be honest, I was getting quite lost and quite confused and panicking that I didn't know where I was going. So I pulled over to the roadside, um, got my phone out to look at the map, and when I looked out ahead of me, I saw a sign. It wasn't this one on the screen, but it was a bit like this one. And for the first time on the sign, I saw Sissinghurst. It showed me that I was going in the right direction. It pointed me the right way to go, and it gave me confidence that I was nearly there. It was a wonderful sign for me at that moment. And I guess um, in these days when so much of our world seems so uncertain, when much of the things that we normally rely on have been taken away from us because of the pandemic, when there's fear and worry, we can feel quite lost, quite concerned about where things are going, where our lives are going, what's happening with us, what's happening with family and friends. We need science. We need things to point us in the right direction, to show us the way to go, to give us confidence that we're nearly there. And in our passage today, Jesus gives a sign. Um, in chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. John's Gospel doesn't tell us many of the miracles of Jesus, but the ones it does tell us, it treats as signs. Not only do they point to Jesus and his power as the Son of God, as the Word made flesh, but they also show us what Jesus is really like and what he's really come to do. There's more to these signs, these miracles, than just stories of Jesus doing amazing things. And, and of course, this miracle is not... Um, a story that's given to us to show us how we can fill up our wine cellars. No, this is a pointer to something far, far more important. So what does this sign show us? Well, first of all, it's a sign that God is not a killjoy. When I was a child, I remember saying to my mum, um, I, I think I'll become a Christian when I'm, I'm much older, maybe in my 20s. I want to enjoy life first. Somehow I'd picked up on this idea that being a Christian meant you couldn't have fun, you couldn't enjoy yourself. Uh, and I'd been sold on the idea somehow that the late teens and wild living was, was the way to really enjoy life, the way to really live it up. But all that's a lie. God is not a killjoy. Yes, in the history of Christianity, there's been many people that seem to have gone against or told us that we should live in ways that take away some of the things that we think bring us joy. So back um, in the times of the Middle Ages, um, to take your, religious, re take your Christianity seriously, you would become a religious person. And that, that meant in those days that you'd become a monk or a nun you would commit to never being married, to having a life of celibacy and never having sex. In, in more recent um, times, in the 19th century and early 20th century, there was a strong movement among Christians um, saying that Christians should not drink any alcohol, that we should be teetotal. Uh, they seem to be implying that God is against drinking alcohol. There were good reasons why people chose to take those steps. But the impression sometimes given is that Christianity is against sex, Christianity is against um, drinking. And yet, this account of Jesus, this encounter that Jesus has with Mary and his disciples, this encounter at a wedding in Cana in Galilee, shows that Jesus is not against marriage. He's not against sex. 
He's not against drinking either because he turns water into wine. Jesus shows that he's not here to bring an end to our joy. Actually, he's here to bring us the fullness of joy and the depth of joy. Yes, of course, there needs to be limits to sex. There needs to be limits to drinking, and we'll think a bit more about that later on. This is certainly not um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the way you might think about it. But God gives us good things for our pleasure and for our enjoyment. Um, It may not be that drinking alcohol is good for everyone. It may not be that everyone um, will know the joy of sex because it's for marriage. Jesus himself never got married. But God gives us all kinds of good things to enjoy. He's not a killjoy. He wants our good. He wants our happiness. And I did become a Christian as a child when I was nine. And as I lived through my life now for many more years than that, I can truly say that being a Christian hasn't taken away fun or joy from me. Rather, I feel that being a Christian has given me a much happier, more fulfilling and more wonderful life. This is a sign that God is not a killjoy. Rather, as Jesus says later on, he's come that we may have life and have it to the full. So that's the first thing this sign shows us, maybe a fairly obvious thing, but, but secondly, it shows us that it's a sign of hope. One of the um, stranger parts of this um, story is that Jesus has an encounter with, with Mary, his mother, um, they're at this wedding together. Obviously, there's a whole family. Um, Jesus and his brothers and his mother have been invited. Maybe they're related to one of the people getting married. Um, but whatever's going on, they're all there, and um, Jesus' disciples are there as well. Uh, and Mary, his mum, comes to him, and um, there's a problem. There's no more wine. This is a big celebration. The celebration of marriages would go on for days in those days. Um, to have run out of wine was a complete disaster. And it was the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the wine. And and for the bridegroom, this would bring him great shame, great humiliation to run out of wine at the wedding. And Mary comes to Jesus. This shows that actually Mary, as his mother, already has faith in Jesus. We don't know um, really hardly anything at all about Jesus' life between his birth and um, when he started his ministry at this stage, when he was in his 30s. And yet Mary, from what she had experienced at the time of his birth, and no doubt what she had seen in Jesus since, has faith that he has the power to sort out this problem. And so she comes to Jesus and tells him that there's no more wine. And Jesus sort of says to her, well, what's he got to do with me? It's not his wedding. He's not the bridegroom. Why should he sort it out? And then he says something really strange. He says, um, my time or hour has not yet come. Why does he say that? Jesus is not the bridegroom of this wedding. And yet, when you go to chapter 3 of John's Gospel, um, John the Baptist is speaking, and he talks about Jesus as being the bridegroom. And he's talking about um, the sort of hopes that the Old Testament had of of the Messiah that would come. um, But now, as the bridegroom in heaven is not some earthly bride, some some woman on earth that he's marrying, but, but the church, God's people. This is looking to um, the heavenly banquet, the great feast of eternity. And Jesus seems to be saying to Mary, um, look, you're asking me to sort out this problem now, to make life a bit better now. But that's not why I've come. I've come to bring eternal hope and eternal life. My time or my hour, depends which translation you look at, has not yet come. And that phrase, my time, my hour, is a phrase that will be developed as we go through John's Gospel. And increasingly, we'll see that it comes to be Jesus' way of pointing to um, the climax of the Gospel, 
when he'll die a horrible death on the cross, but be raised again from the dead, um, the time and moment of his glory, of his glorification. That time has not yet come, and, and, and the great banquet, the great feast, the great um, wedding of the bridegroom can't happen until that happens. His time has not yet come. But Jesus does do something about the problem at hand. He does make life a bit better now. But in saying this to Mary, he wants to be clear to her. I've not come to sort out these small problems. I've not come to bring a bit of happiness at this moment. Rather see this answer to your request as a sign pointing towards the far greater happiness that I want to bring you, the far greater blessing that I want to bring to, to the whole world. And as we go through life, yes, God wants to bring us joy, and God will re regularly answer our prayers and, and help make our life a bit better when we ask for those things. But sometimes he won't. Sometimes for reasons we can't always understand, he will allow bad things to continue. Life won't always be easy. There will be struggles, there will be pressures, and maybe at the moment we feel it more than other times. But these signs, the sign of the, turning the water into the wine, the times God has answered your prayers in amazing ways, they're not really the ultimate thing God is about, but they are pointers to what God will do at the end of time, to the great, joyful, and wonderful banquet when the bridegroom marries the bride, when we are fully united with God and get to be with him fully and perfectly forevermore, where well, there's no more pain or suffering, but true rejoicing, true joy, true fun, true blessing forevermore. In the prophets of the Old Testament, wine was often a symbol of that blessing from God. And now in this sign, Jesus points to that future hope that he will bring about once he's died on the cross and risen from the dead. And so as you struggle, maybe with difficulties now, maybe because of COVID, maybe for other reasons, look to the hope that this sign points to. Look to what Jesus will bring. Know that even though there may be tough times now and tough times ahead, the end goal when you trust in Jesus is to know blessing and joy forevermore. So this is a sign that God isn't a killjoy, he wants to bring joy. It's a sign of hope that God's ultimate plan for us is eternal joy and blessing. But it's also a sign of grace. One of the um, details that John records here is that um, he uses the ceremonial washing jars. That's where the water goes into. Um, they were there for people to wash so they could wash away the sin and the guilt that came about from disobeying the law. Uh, and that was the problem with the law, isn't it? The law seemed to condemn people, to seem to tell you where you were going wrong. And the Jewish ceremony was a way of trying to wash that away, a symbolism of that. And yet the law is good. Jesus doesn't destroy the water jars, but uses them and transforms them to bring about something even more special, something even more wonderful. John mentions this as a pointer to something deeper that is going on, to show that this is a sign of something more powerful, more wonderful. So what is it about? Let's go back to thinking about the law and thinking about fun, thinking about drink and sex and so on. See, the law aims to protect. The reason it says in the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery, is not to say that sex is a bad thing, not to limit sex or to stop sex, but to stop you having sex with the wrong person, to stop sex that damages relationships, that destroys marriages. And the Bible's teaching about sex is that God created it, God made it, God told Adam and Eve to have sex, to, to have children. Sex within marriage is encouraged and is seen as a positive thing that strengthens the marriage relationship. 
But sex outside marriage, the Bible is clear, damages relationships, damages people. And so the law is there to protect us from that. And the same with drink. Actually, I looked through the Old Testament, and there's very little in the Old Testament that says that um, drinking is bad for you. Um, there's a few things, and there's, there's, a, um, there's a few stories in Genesis that show that um, drinking can be a, lead you to in, into dodgy behaviour, and um, there's some warnings in the Proverbs that warn against drinking too much. In the New Testament, it's clearer. It says that those that are perpetually drunk, unless they change their ways, aren't part of the kingdom of God, and there's, there's wor- words, verses that say, do not dr- be drunk. But again, we know that that's there to protect us, isn't it? It's there to warn us. And we, and we know that if you drink too much, it causes problems. We know that if you get drunk, you're likely to behave in ways that you may later regret. Um, we know that if we regularly get drunk or regularly drink too much, it will destroy and ruin your health. And it's really sad. I've known people that have died far too young because they've been a perpetual drinker. The law, the rule, don't become a drunkard, don't get drunk, is there for our protection. The law is a good thing. But the problem is that we also often fail to obey the law. We don't live by its precepts and direction. And when we fail to bring, obey the law, the law becomes not so much a guide to protect us, but it feels like it's there to condemn us, to make us feel guilty, to bring shame to us to point out what is wrong with us. And when we see the law in that way, and when we feel the law's pressure in that way, then we we want to hide from the law, we want to forget the law, we want to ignore the law, we want to reject the law or change the law. The law stops being a good thing for us. But Jesus comes with a different way of dealing with it, of dealing with this problem. Jesus brings grace. And actually, this story is a story of grace. Let's see this from the point of view um, of the bridegroom of the wedding in Cana. He's there, he's, he's meant to provide enough wine for his guests to, to enjoy the celebrations. But the wine has run out. Why has it run out? Maybe he's just not planned carefully enough. Maybe um, he's very tight and not generous and um, trying to save money um, and so he hasn't bought enough wine. But potentially in this small village, this small community, uh, the rest of his life he's going to be known as the person who didn't provide enough wine at the wedding. He's going to feel the shame and the guilt for that for years to come. Uh, and he's facing a real embarrassment. And what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus has no obligation, no reason to help the bridegroom. It's not his wedding. He's not responsible for providing the wine. But he steps in. He does what he doesn't have to do. And he does it in a way that is completely over the top. He doesn't just provide a little extra wine, he provides 800 bottles worth of wine. And he doesn't just provide cheap plonk, he provides wine that's better than the previous wine. The head steward points it out, doesn't he? He says, look, most people leave the the rubbish wine to last, but you've brought the best wine out. Now now the bridegroom, rather than being ashamed, rather than being known as the one who's um, failed to provide enough wine for his guests, becomes the one known who's provide, who provides the best wine for his guests and keeps them going. Jesus' miracle, Jesus' actions, takes away the shame of the bridegroom. It washes it away, almost completely with wine. Wine in abundance. And yet he does it in jars that are there for the cleansing of the Jewish regulations. Do you see what this sign points to? It points to the fact that Jesus has come to wash away our shame, to wash away our guilt. Just before he goes to the cross, what does he do with his disciples? He washes their feet. As a sign of the act of service he's going to give as he dies on the cross for them. Jesus comes and brings grace. Grace is when people do things for us that we don't deserve, that they're not obliged to do, but they do them 
nonetheless, generously, wonderfully. And God's grace to us in Christ is that he wondrously gives to us what we don't deserve. He, he takes away our guilt. He takes away our shame. Um, he washes it away. He cleanses us from it through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The story of Jesus turning water into wine is a story of grace, but it points to the greater grace that comes when we trust in Jesus. And, and you see, when we know God's grace through Christ, when we know that our sins are forgiven, when we know that when we've broken the law that God will no longer condemn us for that, that the law no longer condemns us for that, then we can see the good in the law. We can see that it's there for our protection, we can see that it's there for our good, and we can more easily take it seriously and more easily follow it and live life in the way God calls us to. Enjoying life in the way that we can. Enjoying sex within marriage if we get married. Enjoying um, drink in sensible ways if that's safe for us. And all the other things God wants to bless us with. As it says at the beginning of John's Gospel, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. At the end of this, the disciples see what Jesus has done. I don't think, great, let's follow him, we'll have lots of wine. No. Rather they put their trust, it says, in Jesus himself. They don't look to wine as the blessing. They look to the one who provides the blessing. And they trust in him, and they follow him. Don't dismiss Christianity because you think it might destroy your fun. Rather come to Jesus as the one who is the ultimate source of blessing, the ultimate source of fun, the ultimate source of joy. I did that when I was nine years old, and I haven't looked back, and I haven't regretted it. Will you follow Jesus as a sign, as a one who will bring happiness, the one who will bring joy? Will you follow Jesus, the one who will give you hope that even though this life may be tough, you can look forward to that far greater end? Will you follow Jesus as the one who brings grace? will wash away the times you failed to live up to God's guidelines and direction and learn to live joyfully, not under condemnation, but eagerly living the way God calls us to live. Will you follow the sign? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these signs about Jesus, for these encounters with Jesus. Help us to have that faith, that trust in Jesus that the disciples discovered that we too may know life, life to the full now, joy in your blessings now, but looking forward in hope to that greater joy and greater blessing you'll bring, and confident that in you there is now no longer any condemnation because of the grace that Jesus brings. Amen.